channel. Today we're going to talk about the importance of pausing to celebrate great accomplishments or moments in our lives and acknowledging God's blessing in them. Let's go. Hey everybody, it's that Sunday School Girl of that sundayschoolgirl.com. Welcome to the lesson for Sunday, March 18th. Well, today was daylight savings time, and I trust that you were not one of the people who forgot to set your clock ahead by one hour, because if you were, that likely means that you were late or you missed Sunday school, but that's not this community. That's not you. You were in class, and you were an active part of the discussion, and you had a wonderful class session on today, and I am praying already that not if, but when the opportunity presents itself this week for us to activate what we are learning in these lessons, that we will pass the test as we are working through acknowledging God in all that we do. If you're new around here, welcome. You have just join the largest and the most engaged cyber community of Sunday school students on the World Wide Web. I am thrilled that you're here. You are joining a tremendous group of Christian education leaders, superintendents, teachers, students, people like you, pastors who love the ministry of Sunday school. I am so humbled and honored as I receive emails and I meet people in various churches who are connected with this ministry and it is absolutely incredible. Do me a favor, leave me a note, let me know how you found the channel. I want to say hello back to you, but I need everyone, just do it even if you think you've done it, just make sure that you've hit the subscribe button wherever it is and make sure that you've also hit the little bell so that you get the notifications as soon as content is posted on this channel. I am just, again, excited excited that you're here. We are growing. And again, we're engaged with each other. So thank you to those who leave comments. You're sharing back things from your study. Um, I love it. Last week, I had a uh, some opportunity to engage back and forth with some folks who had questions or things that they saw in the lesson or uh, th thoughts that they had about the lesson. It was kind of like, okay, I can I can work with that, but it's a great place to expand our learning and to challenge each other. So again, welcome. Tell someone else about this channel. Now we're going to get into our lesson study for today, but I want to remind you that once again, the TSSG notes that will accompany this video are available online. If you will click the link, there's a link in the info box below that gets you to the notes and you can download these and maybe if you want to pause now and grab them so that you have them for the lesson or you can print them afterwards and uh, just take them on your journey and have them with you all week. Uh, I have gotten really great feedback on them and again, I caution you that these are just my notes and I want to continue to say that because I am not an official publisher. Um, I do not represent at this time any publisher, and I do not um, tout myself as a scholar of any sort, but this is literally how I personally have worked through the lesson, the things that I saw, things that jumped out to me, and just sort of how my mind processes God's word. So again, not an authority at all, but certainly another resource that will help you expand and maybe see things in a different way. Um, and just great because you can turn these into a notebook and at the end of the quarter, we'll all have a really great uh, reference manual. I was so, I'm not sure it was a mix of emotions. I was floored, flabbergasted, appalled, and amused uh, when I got a comment from a preacher who says, I could preach your notes. I was like, really? So anyway, they're out there. Grab them if you think they'll be helpful. And I pray that they're a great blessing. Listen, that's all I have. Let's get into the lesson for this week. Our lesson title is Solomon Dedicates the Temple. Our Bible basis is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. The Bible truth. The presence and the glory of the Lord filled the temple through fire. Our memory verse is verse 3. And the lesson aim is that we will agree with being thankful and worship God, aspire to worship Him in both simple and grand ways, and plan a celebratory worship service to celebrate God's promises. A little bit about me right now. I am juggling a lot of priorities, personal priorities with family and ministry, school and studying. There is just a lot going on. And as I evaluate things right now and what I can afford to take on and things that I may need to defer, everything seems to be funneled through one particular lens. May 12th at 1 o'clock p.m. May 12th at 1 o'clock p.m. What is May 12th? 
one o'clock p.m. It is my graduation day from law school, and I am so overwhelmed by the idea that this is all coming to an end, that God really allowed this to happen for me. And I am looking forward to the ceremony proper, but also a time of celebration with my family, with my friends. And so I'm already thinking about what that looks like. Last week, I picked up my uh, robe and regalia. And so this is really happening. And we're thinking already about what that looks like to pause and punctuate this moment and to celebrate God for what he's allowed to happen in my life and how I involve family and friends. You know, the old, how many tickets do you get to the graduation and who can come and what do we do afterwards? We're thinking through all of those things now. And I've been through some iterations of that, you know, a graduation party. You know, folks say, you got to have a party. You got to celebrate. Well, I'm not a party girl and I don't really know what I would do at a party. I don't even think it would be that much fun. But I am certainly open to a really nice dinner and having people to come and to celebrate. So we're thinking about what that looks like. And I know it's going to be a lot of fun. But I think the really big idea, again, is pausing to celebrate when God has allowed something wonderful to take place in your life. And we should do that. And that's exactly what we see in this week's lesson as Solomon dedicates this temple. Now, this is our second week in the book of 2 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles by its construct is a lot like 1 and 2 Kings, but it was written much later, and it's believed to have been written by Ezra. Now, 1 and 2 Chronicles is a continuous book that talks about the life and the line of the second king of Israel, who was David. Um, so if you look at 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, the reading of it is as well the dedication of this temple. So it's just a, kind of another perspective of this particular occur occurrence. Now, Solomon succeeded his well-known father, David, as king. And Solomon is a young man, and his kingdom is strong. It's secure. He is up front, out front, and in charge. And we talked about this. If you missed last week's video, you might go back and take a look at it because, again, it's a great setup for the scene that we're still into where there are thousands of people. And these people range from who's who to who are you. And they're all at this feast and festival. It is a 14-day celebration, and it is over this period of time that this prayer, this really long prayer, takes place. And again, this event is acknowledging something incredible that's happened in their lives. It's an awesome event, um, punctuating something awesome that's taking place. There's fabulous food, fabulous worship. They rest, and they come back tomorrow. That kind of sounds like the Holy Convocation. But anyway, there again are thousands of people and it's a time of worship and a time of sacrifice. It's a very, very public event on the summit of Mount Moriah. We talked last week about the worship being elevated. So this is an elevated celebration and an elevated worship. And Jerusalem is in her full splendor. It was it was a good time for them. And Solomon has built what is arguably the most beautiful building in the history of the world. But that temple itself is not to be compared with God or his splendor. And as we learned in this past week's lesson, it is not a vehicle by which God can be controlled. Um, there were really some big ideas from last week's lesson. Now, if we look at, um, let's talk about the temple for a second. It was very precise in its instruction for building, its design, the materials, the interior decorating, uh, the attire that persons would wear inside. That was all given in 1 Chronicles chapter 28. And there was nothing about the temple's building that was left to chance. This was all very intentional and all very purposeful. And Solomon is aware of just how amazingly awesome this moment is. It is. It really is a demonstration of the uncontainable greatness of God, which we saw in last week's lesson, that God could not be confined to this temple. And I was laughing with a friend today how we use these words, great and awesome, and, you know, they're just common language now, you know, oh, this was awesome. You know, count how many times you hear awesome in a day, but this was truly a moment that was awesome for the children of Israel. Now, remember this. God always wanted relationship with his people. And it was always conditional. When they did their part, he did their part. When they followed him, he blessed them. 
and he blessed them in ways that they could never imagine. But when they separated themselves from him and chose to go after idols, then he would have to do something to get their attention. And that would always be a really chaotic time for them. So again, the people, even when Solomon prayed, he says that, you know, if your people sin and, you know, they likely will because we're not perfect people. But if that happens, when that happens, look to this temple and forgive. That was the ending of last week's lesson. This temple took seven years to build and Solomon actually took 13 years to build his own palace, which some people do criticize. But again, there was nothing half done about the temple. In fact, it was modeled in many ways after the tabernacle and they were able to bring the presence of God into the temple, into the heart of the temple. And in last week's lesson, there were really three big ideas that we saw. First, that God's faithfulness led to hope that God is just and merciful and that God is majestic and he's accessible and he's available. In fact, some version of the lesson said there is no God like him. And in this prayer, there's kind of a bridge. It's a continuation again from six to seven. And there are um, six or seven, depending on how you divide it up, uh, petitions, if you will, that or categories that Solomon prays in this prayer. Um, He asks, for justice, um, when something had gone wrong between two parties, that if one neighbor has wronged another, that the neighbor that is wrong would face consequences and the one that was right would be vindicated, that God would come to their aid when they were defeated in war, even if it was a time that they had turned their backs or sinned against God, that when there was a drought, God would hear them when they prayed and forgive that in times of disaster and affliction that led to shortage, that God would hear and forgive them when they prayed. As it related to aliens or people who were not from that area, he prayed that they would hear about God's reputation and what he was capable of doing, and they themselves would turn to God, um, that the temple in some ways would be the gospel for all, almost a great commission kind of feel to it. Um, Also, when people had sinned, when they prayed in that place that God would heal and forgive. And now here we are at this point again of celebration and of dedication. I took some time to look up the word dedication. I suggest that you do the same and develop a definition. But again, a time of um, setting apart something, a solemn act of setting apart a religious ceremony or to devote uh, some time to something good that has taken place. Our printed text takes us to chapter seven, verses one through nine. Now, remember this again from last week that Solomon has been praying. He's on this brazen altar. Um, The worship is elevated. Solomon is on his knees. He's humbled. His hands are raised. He's offered himself completely. He's before the people. They see their leader unashamedly praying and worshiping. And his back is to the people and he's facing God. His focus is on God. That was all in chapter six that we saw this really, uh, the, the crux of this really long prayer. But here we are in seven and notice he's coming to an end of it, but he doesn't just jump up and leave. And we're guilty of that sometime when we start to pray and we told God everything that we want from him and everything that we need him to do in every way that we need made and every person we want him to touch and to help. But Solomon is still in place and he waits and God gives an answer. And God's answer in this context was immediate and it was drastic. It was very visibly the presence of God. And when God responded, you'll note, and I hope that you're taking notes that you have your notes either printed or you have your own system, but there are three um, distinct things that happen when God responds. The first is that there is fire from heaven. Secondly, the fire consumes the sacrifice. Thirdly, the glory of the Lord fills the house. Let's talk about each one of those. First, there's fire from heaven. And fire, first of all, fire by its nature has a lot of capability. Fire can purify, fire can consume, burn something completely down. Fire can empower and fire more than anything can spread. And so just think about the nature of fire as we're getting this visual of fire from heaven. And this fire indicates that God has heard and that he is present and he is answering. In the Old Testament, when we see fire, it is representative of the presence of God. Here, where we see fire, 
It is a sign that cannot be mistaken. When you see fire, you know that you have seen fire. And I looked at other places that we've seen fire in the Old Testament. One of those would be the burning bush um, and Elijah and the prophets of Baal. In fact, Hebrews says that our God is a consuming fire. Um, the, I guess, aha that I had from this, this is that God answers us in ways that cannot be mistaken. And here this fire comes from heaven. There is no mistaking that God is answering. He has answered and he is answering with certainty. In other words, the temple in many ways represented a place of certainty, the certainty of the presence of God. Again, notice that this fire, where does it come from? The lesson tells us that it comes from heaven. And this fire is not just in the temple, but it is seen coming from heaven. When God answers, it's not a secret. Everyone saw that God answered and it was a witness that God was doing something great. Next, we see the consuming fire um, and it consumes uh, it, I, I made a note to myself, and you should do this too, to look at other places in the scripture. I'm not going to give you all the answers where we have seen fire completely consume. And then there is the glory of the Lord filling the house. In other words, they felt the weight of God's presence fill the house, fill the temple. And this, this is what's going on inside. So there is a demonstration that's seen outside of the temple. There is a manifestation and something seen and felt inside of the temple. And just the same, we've seen the presence of God before in a cloud. As a matter of fact, as Solomon is dedicated uh, the temple in earlier portions of this story in this festival, when the ark is returned, the glory of the Lord filled the temple and they had to wait for the cloud to lift before they could even proceed. My connection was that in our lives, we are the temple. Our bodies are a temple is what we're told in the New Testament. And just like this fire that came down from heaven, this consuming fire was very present. The fire of the spirit of God in our lives is God's presence in us. This very much reminded me of the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter two, when tongues, cloven tongues, like as a fire sat up on each of them, it filled the house. We see kind of the same kind of themes that fire came down, consuming presence filled the house and they were touched by the fire of God. And when you are touched by God's fire, there is no secret. It's no secret that it's happened. It's no secret when that consuming fire has consumed you and it has cleansed you and when it has empowered you and as a result, that fire in you should spread. Now I noted, now let's, I like to talk practically about stuff. This is dramatic. If fire comes down out of heaven and I'm in my local church and all of this takes place, that's like not just normal stuff. This is truly, truly a wow moment. And we see that moving into verse, uh, verses two through five. Um, I made notes here and I outlined who do we see playing in here? We see the response of groups of people. Now, again, God's presence was tangible and it hovered, it stayed, it was there. So we see what is considered the transcendent power of God. Remember that he cannot be contained. He's above and beyond um, his creation in ways that we can't even imagine. And there's nothing that limits him. So here is the impact that it had. First of all, we see the priests, we see the children of Israel, and we see the king himself. And everyone had a different reaction to the presence of God. The priests could not enter the house. And this is not the first time they've had this kind of experience that kind of stalls them. Again, back in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 14, when the glory cloud came in, the Shekinah glory cloud, they could not stand in the presence of God. Here, the children of Israel bowed themselves, they worshiped, and they said something audibly. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then there was the king and all the people who offered sacrifice. So again, you've got the glory that has filled the house. And this was not just, again, happening in the temple. There was a demonstration outside of the temple. It was a witness that could be seen to all nations. Uh, my moment here, my connection was that there has to be something seen in our temples and around us that causes the world to see that there is something different about us. Notice the posture of the people. They have bowed themselves 
on their faces before the Lord and they're saying something. They are saying that he is good. God is good and his mercy endures forever. And this is a refrain uh, from the Psalms and I listed those in the notes. It's a refrain from Psalms. They're shouting for joy, even though their faces are down in a worshipful position. Now think about that. That's kind of opposite of what we would necessarily expect, but they are in a response mode to the presence of God, this fire that they've seen. Uh, there's a joyfulness about them because of the time that they're celebrating, but they are humbled and they are awed. So this moment is reverence meets worship, if you will. And at, the response is they are on their knees and it's a moment of joyful awe and humility and submission. It's the awe that you love me the way that you do. And it's humility because I am humbled before you. There is no God like you and you are a great God and you're full of great grace and mercy. And because you are great and you are the awesome God, I submit to you. So that's the position that we see of the people. In Solomon's prayer, his response and the people's posture, what we see flows directly out of scripture. And Solomon responds based on what he knows about God's word. But here we see that the, the pageantry and the worship is not enough. There still has to be a sacrifice. And so the king sacrifices. Uh, verses six through, I believe six and seven talk about everyone being still in their assignments and they're still attentive to what their, what their assignment is. And they're making sacrifices and the offerings are being offered on the altar and there are trumpets blowing and the refrain talking about the mercy, the mercy of God is his loving kindness and God's loving kindness. They recognize has been extended to them. Think about last week's lesson where Solomon talks over and over again about the faithfulness of God and the promises that were made to his father, David, and how how God, you've done what you said you would do. And now here they are talking again about the fact that his loving kindness, it lasts for how long? It lasts forever. And as they're making the sacrifice, and this was a huge, huge sacrifice, like tens of thousands of animals are listed in this sacrifice. In fact, it was enough meat for two weeks uh, had they been consuming it. Uh, this was so much of a sacrifice that the altar was not even able to receive the offering. It was too much for the altar and the priest had to, um, had to create more or less a specially consecrated area in the front of the temple to receive the sacrifices again because the altar was too small. The lesson somewhat closes tying back to David and we learn that the festival itself is extended. Our printed text stops just shy of verses that are very familiar to us, either through popular preaching texts or in times of crisis or disaster when our nation is in trouble. And that's verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now, I've got to tell you a story about why this kind of connected for me. And I borrowed these. My mom is in the next room, so don't tell her. I borrowed these from her drawer. But these are from the recipe drawer. And you can probably tell they're older. They've got dog ears. They're kind of discolored. Um, there are a couple that I have to be really careful with because they've got small tears in them. But these are recipes that have been handed down or shared. And although as a cook, she almost never goes to any of these drawers. We almost never go to these drawers for any of these items. This one I have to be really careful with. It's in pieces. But these... If there ever comes a point that we were to forget something or something didn't come out quite right, we can always go back to the recipe. And that's what this lesson really made me think about. The printed text is these little note cards because God knew his children. He knew them because of their behavior in the past. So he knew their history and he knew them. So he knew their propensity. And although this moment was a celebratory time for them and they were in awe of him and they were on their faces, 
He knew that they would go from this day and they would enjoy life and things would be good and they would experience a high time and they would forget this moment, this awing moment, this submitted, humble moment. They would forget that when life got good and at some point they would turn from him and they would go to their conveniences and their creature comforts. But what he always gave them was the recipe on how to get back. He gave them the roadmap of right relationship as he responded to them in that consuming fire moment. He said that if, if I go on strike, if I shut up the heavens and there's no rain because God is in complete control, he was the one that had control of everything. God has all power. But if these things happen, and he only did these things when they were separated from them. So if I do these things because I've had to get you all back on track, you know the recipe. That's where that comes from. If my people will do the things that you're doing today, humble yourselves, pray, seek my face, acknowledge the awing of my presence, do all those things. Then am I going to turn my face toward that temple and remember who you are and heal your land? God again knew that at some time in the future, they would likely separate themselves from him, but he always gave them the recipe to get back to him, to be humble, to pray, to turn their faces toward him, which meant that their faces would have been turned somewhere else, but to seek his face. And that's the connection that I make with acknowledging God in everything that we do. Here are my key learnings from the week. The first thing is that God responds to us. He hears us and he answers and he answers with certainty. When God responds, there is no mistaking that he has responded. Secondly, there should be a certainty in our lives based on our relationship with God. And it's evidenced by the fire of God in us that comes to purify us and it empowers us and it spreads to others. Next, I continue to think about the humility that we all have to walk in, realizing that it is a great God who empowers us to do what we do. And on our own, apart from him, we can do nothing. And that's why we have to constantly seek his face, seek his wisdom, seek his guidance in all that we do. There is, there's no decision that we can afford to make absent consulting God. The consuming presence of God compels us to worship. It consumes us because it is so great. It is heavy. The weight of his glory is so heavy and it consumes us, but it should also like that fire spread to others. We are to walk in joyful awe and humility and submission to who God is, remembering that our worship is our witness. And again, it spreads to others. The last thing was really this, and I thought about my grandpa. He used to always say when he prayed, God, you are the boss. And I'm understanding more what that means. That means that I submit to your rule in my life. And it's a joyful submission. We should enjoy having God's presence in our lives. It is a joy to be his representative. It is a joy to be identified with Christ. This is the lesson for this week. I have a couple of other questions in here that I'll kind of be chewing on all week long in my personal reflection. I absolutely cannot wait until you all start commenting and telling me the things that you're, you're seeing. I guess I'm thinking a lot about grandpa. He used to tease me. Um, I don't eat a lot of like fried chicken on the bone. I like chicken strips. I'm just not fond of chicken on the bone. And he would look at the bones and he would say, you don't know how to eat chicken. And I'd say, well, what do you mean? He'd say, there's still half a chicken on that bone. That's kind of how I feel about this lesson this week. I, I, I feel like there's still meat on the bone. So that to say that I will continue to study. I am so open to things that you will get out of the lesson this week. And I hope that you're, you will share back with me. That's it. I'm going to run. Everybody have a super fantastic week. I will see you in Sunday school. Bye, everybody. Yeah.